Hey, Teach Better fam, it's Chris here with another bonus episode for you. In this bonus episode, we are highlighting the current Focus on the Focus series with Caitlin Giordano and Dave Schmidto. Every Wednesday at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern, Caitlin and Dave go live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter to discuss grading, assessments, and providing students with meaningful feedback. We really hope you join us live on those Wednesdays, but also wanted to provide you with a recap from the weekly episodes that they are recording. We hope you enjoy this. Let's get into the episode. I love that intro. I feel like it's an alarm clock for people. Like they've got their phone set and they hear that music and they're like, oh, something's going on. Let's go see what it is. <laughs> That's Time awesome. To go. <laughs> oh, yay. I'm excited. And I, I see we've got some of our friends here tonight too, Caitlin. So let's just say our hellos to some of our favorite friends. We've got Nikki joining us. Um, Caitlin, I think she's challenged you to drop some truth bombs tonight. So is that something you think you can handle? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm ready. I think I think so. Get your little tweet worthy <laughs> thumbs out, people. Caitlin's gonna be talking. So Holly Stewart's giving us some green heart love. Love it. Holly Stewart. She wasn't able to join us live last week, but if you were able to see any of her comments afterwards, I think she had some fun watching the replay. So that's that's awesome. And Ryan from the KC area. Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much for, for joining us. And Holly Essie, yeah, she's ready. Candace is here as well. And if I didn't say it yet, everybody, Caitlin Giordano is here. Caitlin, Caitlin, Caitlin. Let, let's just do some quick intros real quick. People, I, I know there are a lot of people w- tuned in last week and heard us do the intros and heard what we were going to be talking about. But there might be a few people that are joining us for the first time tonight, which is awesome. If that's the case, welcome to the show. Caitlin Giordano is here. She is in the house. Caitlin, can you just tell people who you are and where you're from? Absolutely. So Caitlin Giordano, I am a sixth grade English and history teacher in the Chicago suburbs. And I am also the director of curriculum and instruction for the Teach Better team. And I and, love to talk about assessment and poke the bear with Dave. And, all the and time. you're brilliant. And you are <laughs> just incredible. Like when, when people say you, you drop truth bombs, that is it. You are like a walking tweet machine <laughs> is what you are. I feel like when right. people just need to sit around and record your words and just just literally capture every single thing you say because you take some of these big abstract concepts and you're so brilliant. You can make them so sim- simple, you know, that, and I think that's the sign of somebody that's that's smart and brilliant is taking the abstract and mundane and making it so that people like me can understand it. So, so happy to be here with you. You're making me blush, Dave. Oh my gosh. You're making <laughs> me blush. But seriously, okay. I feel like you're just stealing everything I say about you all the time because I feel like you have like the Schmidt quotes thing. That's going to be my new hashtag. <laughs> so anybody that hears anything that Dave says that's brilliant because he always says something, Schmidt quotes, that's my new hashtag. We're going to use that. Uh, but Dave, you got to tell us who, like, who you are, what you do, what's going on with you. Well, I am uh, the founding member of the Caitlin Giordano fan club. Um, <laughs> I hang out in my basement and I talk to Caitlin as much as I can. Um, I wear shirts with her name on it. No, um, all that's true. <laughs> all of that is true. But I am Dave Schmidow joining you from my basement. I, um, uh, I've been in education for more than two decades now. I'm the old man of the group. I love talking grading assessment. Former teacher, former middle school principal, elementary principal, assistant superintendent, college professor, and just, uh, again, total groupie of yours. So being able to, to talk shop with you tonight, cannot wait, cannot wait. Um, before we go, though, let's let's bring out one of these Schmidt-isms that Holly's talking about that you bring. Focus on the focus. It's a total schmidt It's one of those. <laughs> See, here's the thing. You say the, the, the schmidt quotes. Most of my schmidt quotes are the dumbest things ever. Like, focus on the focus. It's I'm so redundant. I'm, I'm not even creative. I can't think of new original words. So we just repeat words more than once. Focus on the focus. What are we focusing on tonight, Caitlin? So our whole focus tonight is talking about measuring what matters. 
So those of you that joined us last week, amazing. We're gonna recap a little bit for those of you that did it. And you can check out the recording because everything's recorded. Mm -hmm. You can go back and listen. But we are focusing tonight on measuring what matters. Last week, we talked all about what grades mean, what they are supposed to be for uh, in an ideal world, what they would do for us. And truly, at the heart of it, grades are communication. And that's what we kind of landed on last week was this notion that we're not using them as compensation. We're not using them as tools for motivation because that kind of stuff just doesn't work. So we're focusing now this week on how to measure what does matter, how to take a system that you might be working within and find ways to make it work for your values, make it work for the work that you want to do with grading, assessment, and all of that good stuff. Yeah, spot on. And a great recap, too. We are talking about last week, wait, it was just a big overview of grades. Why do they even matter? And and I know I, I had a couple of side conversations with people about this whole conversation about grades and how they are communication. And one person in, in particular, we were in this great conversation. It started off as a debate and then we walked away being completely in line with our thinking because they were telling me that they don't think that their grades communicate anything because their grades are broken. They said they're, they're in a system where my grades are broken. It doesn't line up with the stuff you're talking about. So they're, they don't communicate. And I, I challenged them and said, no, actually, they are communicating. They're communicating your values. They're communicating what you think is important, what your district thinks is important, what your school thinks is important. They are definitely communicating something. Might not be communicating what you want to communicate, but they are sending a very strong message to other people. So that was kind of our conversation last week is what message are you sending and what message are others receiving? Because that's what your grades are doing. Yeah. That sum it up for us? Okay. Perfect. So today's conversation we're going to take that 30,000 foot view and we're starting to, to fall now. We're getting closer to the ground and we're going to start <laughs> narrowing our focus and giving some people some very clear takeaways of how to start focusing on the focus, measuring some of those things that truly matter. How do you take your grades, your assessments, your priorities, your standards, and kind of put them all in alignment so that what you're communicating is as accurate as humanly possible. So yeah. you ready to jump into this? I'm so ready. Let's do it. Okay. So I think maybe, can I, can I just start off with like a, a big concept and then we'll kind of see where this goes. And if other people have questions, they can drop them in the comments and we can answer theirs. But yeah. yesterday. I love that journey for us. Okay. So yesterday I had the opportunity, I was working with um, a, a big school district, um, a relatively big school district, a district of about 50 schools. And we were talking standards-based grading. And they came to the table. We, we were unpacking things. We only had the opportunity to meet for two hours. And I say only because <laughs> we're meeting collectively here for five hours. And we were wrestling, like, how do we focus on priorities and just get to the, the nuts and bolts? So I only had two hours yesterday with a district. This was a district that has report cards that they consider to be standards-based. They are K-12 standards-based. And we were examining their current report cards and what they look like. So I, I'll give you two examples. I'll give you a first grade example and a sixth grade example. And then let's kind of unpack what some of the struggles were, okay? And the first grade example that I looked at, they had a report card that was three pages long and it had 131 standards on it, okay? The sixth grade report card had 257 standards, okay? So the first grade report card, 131. Sixth grade, 257 standards. And their their logic was, we are standards-based, so we're putting all the standards on the report card, we are measuring the progress all the way throughout the year, we're clearly and specifically articulating progress on all of the standards. So, Caitlin, I'm looking at your face here, and I feel like you've got some things to say. Oh, my God! Okay, so... <laughs> I teach sixth grade and you just said 257 standards and I'm thinking yeah. to myself like, oh my gosh, that's like, I I don't even, I don't even know. I don't even know how to process that level of information. And if I, the educational professional, the person who has degrees in the area of education is thinking that about this 257 standard report card, I can guarantee that families who do not have degrees in education, who are not educational professionals, and students who are doing the learning and trying to interpret their progress over time are probably going to have a lot more questions than me, the person freaking out about the 257 standards. I, so, I feel like it's important to know, though, 
that I can, I understand where they're coming from. These are the standards that we have during the school year. These are the standards that we look at. And here is what I would contend. The standards on your report card, the standards that you're assessing for a grade or whatever it might be, it doesn't need to be every single standard that you teach during the school year. I can tell you without a doubt, I probably teach a high number of standards. I couldn't even count them all because I, I don't even know at this point how many individual standards I teach during a sixth grade English school year. But what I can tell you is that I don't assess every single standard that I teach. Sometimes I'm filling in gaps with background knowledge that kids may not have that they need. Sometimes I may be extending for kids beyond a standard that we're in. So I'm teaching something different to them because they're already here. A lot of the times you're building in multiple different contents or multiple different ideas or skills or what have you into a particular lesson, activity, what it, whatever it might be. That doesn't mean you have to assess every single one of them. So if I'm looking at that, that's not what I need to do. Okay, Caitlin, ready for some bear poking? So I'm going to yeah, play devil's advocate. First of all, I 1,000% agree with you <laughs> and have a lot of things I want to even add on to what you just said. Yes. So I'm going to throw some things at you that I have heard in this conversation from other people. And there might be some people thinking these things right now, and maybe they'll, they'll end up in the comments. Okay. So let's, let's focus on the sixth grade one, because that's your wheelhouse. So 257 yes. standards. So the 257 standards represented the four core areas. Their report card only measured math, science, social studies, and language arts. It was 257 standards. Um, some quick analysis. If you threw ma uh, music, art, and PE, the three most popular electives, that number swells to 1,431 using their matrix of including every single standard. Okay. 1,431 standards. But let's just, we're not going to go there. Let's just focus on 257, the four core subject areas. Okay. So they said, and they were spot on accurate, like you said, those were the standards. That is what others on high have deemed to be the standards. And now using my own words against me, a standard is only standard if it's standard. Again, redundant quote, Schmidt worthy because I can't, I'm not creative. If a standard is only standard if it's standard and the state common core, the people on high have said, these are the standards. Who are we as lonely educators to pick and choose some standards that are more important than others? Who are we? We are the professionals. We are the trained educational professionals. This is our job. This is what we do. We assess standards that our students are learning. That is our job. That is literally what we learn how to do when we go to school. That is literally the job that we do when we get into the classroom. Who better to do it than the person teaching them? Who better to determine which standards are the ones like, yes, they need these to be successful in the next grade level, in the next grade level and beyond? We are. Yes, that's our job. Okay, but Caitlin, but Caitlin, oh, <laughs> sweet Caitlin, you're so naive. <laughs> I'm joking. Yes, here. I am. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm completely, I'm completely joking. But there are others that are going to think, but Caitlin, if I choose which standards are more, I could choose incorrectly because at the end of the year, there's this big, mean, scary test that my students are going to have to take. And if I choose wrong, I might be dooming my students to a pathway of not proficient. And that's going to condemn them for the rest of their lives. Caitlin, Caitlin, help me. How do I choose correctly? How do I know what's the most important thing to, to choose from? So that's actually like I get the fear. I do, especially if your district places a lot of value on those big tests. I totally understand the fear of that because I am a classroom teacher. I get that pressure. I get how it feels to be like, okay, uh, what if I pick wrong? You can't pick wrong because I'm not telling you not to teach the other standards. I'm not telling you to stop teaching them. I'm telling you that you only need to assess those really big, powerful, important ones. And those are the ones that come up again and again and again. Mm -hmm. They continue to build on each other. They are showing up cross content. I teach history as well. And I cannot tell you how much I love the history standards because they're basically language art standards, but like with history as the content, it's phenomenal. But they show up again and again and again because they're powerful, because they're important. And I will say it again, you are the educational professional. You know what your kids need to be successful. You know that. I promise you do because you have done the work. 
you're doing the work right now because you're here with us. You've done that work to ensure that you're providing your students with that high quality education and really vetted your material to make sure that you are assessing things that they need to know. Again, okay. you're not only teaching those things, though. <laughs> okay. So this is going to be my last little piece of playing devil's advocate before I dive in and, and give you my two cents on this <laughs> as well, okay? Because I, I want to I front load this with, I understand some of the concerns that people have, okay? So I, I, when I was a teacher, I taught middle school like you. I taught language arts and social studies, had a lot of passion. I know, I know, we're, we're, we're twins, right? Um, so eighth grade social studies, when I taught it, was U.S. history in my district. I loved teaching the Constitution and the law. I loved having those rich debates. I felt like those were that was the most essential unit that I could teach my students in U.S. history. I had a counterpart, though, across the hall who loved teaching the Civil War. I would spend 12 weeks teaching the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, arguing about the amendments and whether or not the Constitution was a living document or not. He would spend 12 weeks talking about the Civil War, the battles, the generals, the strategy, because he thought that was the most essential unit. At the end of that eighth grade year, half of the eighth graders learned and got a different experience the poor ninth grade teacher that had to pick up from the the mess that we made and had to build off it because this was the 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 class was the the founding of the from 1776 to like 1865 and then in ninth grade they picked up from 1865 all the way to current time so these poor kids were half of the kids were coming up with one experience and half were coming up from another experience and it's experiences like that that had people arguing for fidelity oh it's a dirty f word in schools but we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> Talking about fidelity and how everybody needs to be on the same page. And if, if we're all just picking and choosing what we want to focus on, how in the world can we have fidelity? Phenomenal question. Again, Dave, I just love when you play devil's advocate. It's my favorite. <laughs> so here's the thing. When you are the educational professional, it's also your professional responsibility to collaborate with the people that you work with to collaborate with your content area team, to collaborate with your job alike, to ensure that kids are getting that education that they need to be prepared for that next grade level and beyond. So I would say like, yes, there's room for you to infuse what you love because I get that. I do it all the time. But you do have to make sure that when we talk about fidelity in classrooms, I agree with you. I hate when we talk about that because there's th this misunderstanding that fidelity means we're all going to open to page 25, read the same short story. We're all going to do the same activity. We're all going to do it on the same day at the same time. So all of our kids are getting the same exact experience. But that is not what we mean. That is not what we want because that's not what's good for kids. That's not what's good for us. We're the professionals in the situation. So we need to understand that we need to work together. And it doesn't mean work together to all decide that we're going to be on page 25 tomorrow on April 15th. It means that we work together to determine what are the essential skills that our kids need to be successful and move forward in their educational careers. When we do that and we identify those skills, it doesn't always matter how you teach them or what exactly you're using to do it. So you could be using the Civil War or the Constitution to be teaching a particular skill if it's understanding the role of Amer of the United States in history of that time. If that's the essential question, if that's the skill that they're trying to build, you can teach that through the lens that you need to teach it through. Just like I may teach, I teach text evidence using movie trailers. Not everybody does that, but everybody in sixth grade teaches that skill. And that's the point. You definitely have to take on that professional responsibility of collaborating and ensuring that there is that common experience and that all students are getting the essential skills that they need. Oh, so good. See, I told you you are brilliant. You can take <laughs> these big concepts and you just make it so real and practical and so bite-sized for people. So, so first of all, thank you. Thank you for entertaining. We didn't script that ahead of time. I didn't tell you, hey, Caitlin, I'm going to just be dropping some questions at you. Be ready. But <laughs> this, this just goes to show the level of your brilliance because you you ran with these things and we are, we're, we're in sync with just about every single thing that you said. And I'll throw a couple of, I'll start with some anecdotes and I'll give people some quantifiable things to, to run with as well. First, I'll use story and an anecdote that might tell the story a, a little bit differently. So my youngest son, 
Again, four kids. My youngest is Mason, adorable. He's five years old and he's in kindergarten right now. Last year, the beginning of 2020, the, the, the year the world stood still, sweet little Mason had a goal that he wanted to learn how to ride his bike. That was his goal. He wanted to learn how to ride his bike during 2020. He made that goal before he realized he was going to just be home all the time. But <laughs> if we fast forward into May of 2020, I have a picture on my phone of a day where Mason called out to me when we were standing outside. I was at the top of my driveway. He was down on the sidewalk, bike propped up next to him. He's got his hands on the handlebar. He's pushing his bike down the sidewalk, training wheels on it. And he asked me to take a picture of him. I pulled out my phone, took a picture. And I said, Mason, that's, that's adorable. Why'd you want me to take a picture? And he said, dad, I'm, I, I met my goal today. I'm riding my bike. Well, if I were to look at the picture that I have, and if I could share that picture with all of you right now, you would see what I just described. Mason wearing winter boots in May and shorts and a tank top <laughs> standing next to his bike while he's pushing it down the sidewalk. Now in his mind, he accomplished something. He was independently maneuvering his bike somewhere. Unfortunately, the goal that he set or the standard he was trying to achieve was he wanted to be able to ride his bike independently. And in my mind, that means something different than what he was demonstrating. In my mind, riding a bike independently means his butt is probably on the seat. I probably <laughs> have the training wheels off. He's probably pedaling somewhere. But again, that's my own limited perspective. There might be somebody else that says, well, no, Mason could be coasting down your driveway and not pedaling. Pedaling might not be a requirement of that standard. Somebody else might say riding it independently means he can go around the block three times without daddy riding alongside of him. Somebody else might say he can't fall down ever. Like that's, that's what we're discussing right now is what is that level of expectancy, that standard, that standard. And when we talk about fidelity, we're not talking about how I teach him to ride a bike. We're talking about, do we have the same expectation for kids? Do, do me and my wife have the same expectation for what riding a bike actually is? Does Mason understand what <laughs> riding a bike actually is? Because if not, we're, it's going to be difficult for us to clearly articulate progress towards mastery. So I know that's a weird story, but it's part of the story. I loved it. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Anytime I can talk <laughs> about my kids, I beam a little bit. Now, the second piece of this, a little bit more quantifiable. We start talking about 257 standards. I just want to ease everybody's burden. Everybody's burden. There is not a state in America or a province or territory in Canada that expects every single teacher to assess every single standard equally. That's the God's honest truth. It's not the reality. You can go to any state's DOE website and you can find out the standards that they consider to be uh, the priority standards. They might not even list them as priority standards or essential standards. But what they will tell you is that there are some standards that they're assessing every year. There are some standards they assess every three years, some standards they assess every five or seven years. More so than that, when they give you a score report for individual kids, students end up with scale scores on their test. A scale score, Caitlin, is a weighted score. A kid can get a 680 on a test because they answered a lot of difficult questions correctly, more important standards correctly. Another kid could get a 500 and answer more questions right, but they were not essential questions. They weren't essential standards. So their scores are going di to be different. It's not about how many questions you get right. It's do you answer the right questions right? And that's the reality. We're given the Da Vinci Code for this. We're given the secret sauce. If we just know how to interpret it. So we can have that conversation too about how do you decide? So it's not just arbitrary. Can we go there? Yes. Okay. So it is important when you're trying to figure out what does matter and how to figure out what you should be measuring, what standards you should be assessing. Like I said before, it is important to note like, okay, let's think about what are the things that are going to continue to come up? What are the skills that are like vital to my content area? And if you are a teacher, you are the content area expert. You do know the answer to that question because you continuously will teach mm -hmm. those things throughout the year. So those things that continue to come up, those standards, those skills, whatever it might be that you continue to teach, those are usually your big ones. They're usually really important. And you can like then determine, okay, this is essential. This is something my kids definitely need to know. And then when you're talking about how to measure what matters, this is something I really want to get into today because I see this a lot. There are really simple fixes that you can make to your own assessments to ensure that you are measuring what matters. Like we said last week, grades are communication. They are communication of academic proficiency in a given content area at a given time. That is just what they are. That's 
That's what their function is. That's what they exist to do. So when you are measuring and creating an assessment, you've identified these important skills that you're assessing. Great. Let's say our students are creating some kind of project. It's a final project that they're putting together to show their understanding of a particular skill that we have deemed essential. You should only be assessing that academic skill. <laughs> okay. All right. Hold on. I'm going to pause <laughs> you on this because I think we're going to go we're going to go deep into this. Okay. Yes. Is that okay? I'm going to give people yes. a, a piece of homework real quick or a classwork while I start talking. If you have oh. an assessment nearby that you've used, however you define assessment, whether you define assessment as test, quiz, project, classwork, homework, daily work, a thumbs up, whatever assessment you have in your head, go get it, pull it up on your computer, pull it up on your device, put it on your lap, go get one. Cause I think Caitlin in just a second is going to go off and help <laughs> you figure out what your assessment looks like, could look like, should look like, and how to assess it and, and assess your assessment. Okay. Is it Definitely. okay if I just give them a pause real quick? Cause I want them to be able to see this in very practical terms. Okay. Yes. So you're, you're talking about really focusing in on ma making sure you're isolating your variables to use a science term, you know, the, <laughs> the scientific method, you only change one thing at a time. So you can determine what's working and what's not. You want to make sure that you're assessing one unique skill standard with individual uh, questions. So we're going to, let's, let's put that to the side for a second. Cause we're going to go there. It, I want to real quick, go back to how do we even decide what that one thing is? So yeah. how do you, de how do you determine what is the most essential? You talked about a big piece of this, that idea of leverage. And I, I love that Holly Stewart put this in the comments. She was talking about how sh she thinks it's so essential that we focus in on that vertical alignment piece, making sure that we are addressing the needs for the grade level above us or below us. Chelsea Nicolino saying the same thing that she had an administrator suggest that she teach the grade level above uh, for a unit just to try to, to get the kids acclimated and ready for that and so that she could get a sense of what to prepare the kids for. And I think that is a super, super smart way to do this. I'll actually challenge teachers. I'll, I'll give you a homework assignment while you're rustling to go get your assessment. You can do this one <laughs> over the next week if you want to. So you think about 257 standards. This is an activity I have actually walked hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teachers through to help them make this decision. So it's not, let's say, Caitlin, you and I are both teaching history and uh, let's say I'm the Civil War guy and you're the, the, Consti the Constitution girl um, so that we're not arguing about which one is more important. Yeah, we can say, well, what skills are you teaching, which is great, but we're still going to argue over which theme or which unit are we supposed to teach. There are teachers everywhere that argue about which novel you're supposed to teach, which is a whole other story. We don't teach novels just like we don't teach units of history, but that's another story. We teach the skills and the standards, but there are still going to be those people that are arguing and saying, but my standard is more important. And they will stand firm to it. What I try to get people to do is quantify it first. And then you argue about the numbers, not about your values. So look at your standards. And I want you to read your standards three times. Three times. So you're going to have some homework. You have to read your standards three times in the next week. The first time you read it, every single time you see a standard that you believe has leverage, meaning you teach us in fifth grade, it's going to help a kid in seventh grade. You teach us in second grade, it's going to help a kid in fourth grade. It's going to help them into the future. It's going to help them be more successful in the future. Give that standard a point, one point. Then I want you to read your standards a second time. When you're reading your standards that second time, if it's a standard that you think has endurance, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I said endurance and leverage backwards. I'm sorry. That was the endurance one. This, that, this is the leverage. I want you to look at every standard that you think has um, leverage to another subject area. So if you are a language arts teacher, if this is going to help a student be successful in science or social studies, give it a point. If it's a standard in, that you teach in math, it's going to help them in another, give it a point. So you're giving it a point for endurance. You're giving it a point for leverage. Then I want you to look at either DOK or Blooms, whichever one you're most comfortable with. Go through and read it. And whatever level it is on DOK or Blooms, give it a point for that level. So if you are a Blooms believer and if it's an analysis um, uh, standard, then that would be a level three. Or if it's uh, uh, it be a four or five. Exactly. You're giving it points for whatever level it is. Then you go through, add them all up. The ones that are worth the most points are your essentials. If okay, you, and that's fabulous for like, if you are trying to do this with a big group of people, yes. that's an amazing way to go about it because it's, it's quantifiable. It's something that people can do as a big team. I yeah. love that, Dave. This is why you're a genius. Well, and then what, what happens is you, people, people can do this individually and then you start arguing about the points that you assigned. You're not arguing about this one is more important. 
you're arguing about if it has endurance or leverage or whatever the case may be. And in that conversation, it's not about people's personal values on the table, which is where this conversation gets so difficult. You're arguing about numbers. And it's a whole, it's much easier. But the secret to this is you're going to have 10 to 12 in every subject area at every grade level that are far and away outsourcing the rest. So if people want to argue about number 13 or 14, let them argue. But those top 10 to 12, <laughs> you've got magic now. Now you're teaching one big standard to depth with leverage. And <laughs> with four, that's one a month, one a month, yeah. which is way more manageable than 257 or mastering a standard every 0.7 days. So Definitely. just throwing that out there. Okay. <laughs> so that was a lot no, of rambling. I know. It was amazing though, because it's so useful. And it, it's it's the thing that you and I talk about all the time. It opens the door for the conversation. Because when you are having this, this, I, this conversation, this debate, whatever you want to call it, when you're in this space, it does get personal. And it does become, well, I have always taught this. Like, this is important to me. I want to teach this. Don't take this away yeah. from me. But when we can shift that and actually open the door to the conversation, that's an amazing way to do it. I'm so glad I got to be here to witness you telling everybody <laughs> about it. Oh, my God. So you got to hear amazing. Mason and you got to hear us doing a little bit of math. So now I think I'm, I, I would just share that just to, to milk people going to grab their assessment because I want them <laughs> to be able to have something that they're doing. We talked about this last week that our goal is, is not to tell people change everything you're doing, but to reflect on what you're doing. And if you leave this solidly confirmed that you are doing the right work, God bless you. I'm glad we could affirm what you're doing. But if you feel like, oh, I got to refine some things. God bless you. I hope that this helps. <laughs> so, so Caitlin, they've got assessments in their hand, in their head, on their device somewhere. We now have identified what those standards are. We know what standards we're focusing on. We talked early on, you said very specifically, you can teach it all, but you only assess the essentials. If you're yeah. a leader out there, this is a great go-to. Who cares what they teach? Focus on what they assess because eventually what you assess becomes what you teach. But that's a little secret sauce. So you've identified <laughs> what you're going to assess and now you're building an assessment. Okay. So Go. those of you that grabbed your assessment, love that. So what we're going to do now is just kind of talk through like, what are some of the things that you should definitely have on there? And what are some things that you should definitely avoid? So like we talked about last week, you want to make sure that you're communicating a level of academic proficiency at this assessment time. So whatever this assessment that you have is, it's a snapshot in time. It's the time that that student took the assessment and they're showing you what they have learned in whatever unit you've been teaching. You need to determine what skills, specific skills, you are assessing in that project, test, whatever it might be, essay, what skills are you looking for? And so you need to be very clear about that, both on the assessment, but also in how you are assessing it. So if you're using a rubric, those skills you're looking for should be really clear on there. It should be in student-friendly language so that they can look at it and understand it, and so that families can also interpret what they're seeing. So you have to make sure that the skills are clearly defined on the assessment. What skill are you assessing with this question? What skill are you assessing in this essay? What skill are you assessing in that project? It should be clear. The other thing is that it's only academic skills. And this is where I'm going to get like, oh, I really, I'm going to really like oh, rail okay, on this for a okay, minute. Okay, be ready, people. Strap in. <laughs> I'm really going to rail on this for a minute because I, I get it. I do. Like I was the teacher that was like, okay, you have to have two pictures on it or you have to have a picture on every single slide in order to get an A because I want it to look pretty. But folks, is putting pictures on slides an academic skill for English class? No, it's not. <laughs> so we need to ensure, and if that is a skill that I'm assessing, if we're talking about including multimedia as a part of our visual information unit, great. I'm assessing their use of pictures. I'm assessing their use of visual information. But if I am not assessing that skill on this assignment, it should not show Ooh. up on my assessment. Okay. It shouldn't be there. <laughs> You're spot on, spot on. And I, I want to add a little bit of clarity to what you just said it, with, it another, with another Schmidt kid example. So first of all, if, if you are one of my kids' teachers, I am so sorry. <laughs> I get kicked <laughs> under the table constantly when I go to parent-teacher conferences. People tell me, don't open your mouth. And now I'm going to do it 
to the world here. So I, I apologize. This is hypothetical. It's not <laughs> real. Wink, wink, air quotes. Okay. So here, here's, here's the real story. Let's go back in time. March 12th, 2020. A date we're probably all familiar with. It was a Thursday night, the night that the world basically stood still. March 12th, 2020, my phone started blowing up. Everybody was telling me the world is falling apart. Schools are closing everywhere. What are you going to do? One of the phone calls I received was from the guidance counselor at my oldest son's school. He was in eighth grade last year, telling me that school was school was going to be closed and just to anticipate things. We have a pretty good relationship. And so we were able to talk about this a little bit. I asked the counselor, um, okay, what do I need to be prepared for? The counselor said, well, we're, be- we're telling everybody this might be a two-week thing, but I get a sense it's probably going to be two months or longer. So just be prepared. Your first step, go into the grade portal, look at your son's grades, Cameron's grades, and uh, start to determine where you're going to be focusing your energies. Well, when I look at Cameron's grades, A's and B's all over, but his language arts grade was a different story. His language arts grade, first marking period was a B plus, second marking period was a C minus, third marking period was a C. Okay. He's a good kid. So B plus, C minus, and C, not too bad, but dad flags are starting to wait. <laughs> now, more of the story. At the beginning of the school year, I went to parent teacher conferences, met with the teacher, met with all of his teachers. His language arts teacher told me, again, we'll, we'll talk formative and summative assessment, I think next week a little bit or two weeks from now, but told me that their grades and their language arts class were going to be divided into formative and summative grades. Again, not going to go there yet, but that 80% of his grades were going to be based off of a summative assignment every marking period, assessing whether or not Cameron could comprehend text. In essence, she said every marking period, Cameron was going to be able to choose a book and then demonstrate that he understood the book. That's what she told me. First marking period, she said, this is what it's going to be all year long, 80% of his grade. If I took that at face value... And I saw his grades go from B plus to C minus to C. I would start to think, "Uh uh-oh, is Cameron falling behind? Is he not keeping up? Is he not reading at grade level? I would think all of those things. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what I would think. Right. But I had a unique advantage last year. I got to drive Cameron to school every day. And he and I got to have conversations every single morning about what was happening in class. First (laughs) marking period, he told me he read his book and he got an eight question quiz at the end of the marking period where he just had to answer questions about the plot, the setting, the characters, theme, you know, the major elements of, of a story. Nailed it. Did just fine. B plus. Second marking period. Right before Christmas break, teacher says, hey, guys, this time we're changing things up. We're not going to do an eight question quiz. This time, I want you to give a speech when we get back from Christmas, a three to five minute speech about your book. My son is an introvert, scared to death about getting in front of people. His three to five minute speech was 35 seconds long. He ended up with a C minus that marking period. Third marking period, he was given the opportunity to make a video presentation, but at that point, he was afraid everybody was going to laugh at him. They already laughed at him when he sat down after 35 seconds. He wasn't engaged and shut it down. Now, I'm telling the story for a couple of reasons. One, you said to make sure that whatever you're assessing are academic skills. This teacher was assessing academic skills all year long. Comprehension, speaking and listening, all kinds of things. They were academic skills. But what's the problem with this? Why, why is it a muddy mess? Well, number one, because she didn't necessarily know what she was analyzing. Her assessment was not reading comprehension anymore. Her assessment was something much, much different. Not saying those things aren't important. I want right. my son to know how to speak and talk and make eye contact <laughs> and do all those things. But that's not what her grade was communicating to me. That's not what her assessment was truly measuring. So exactly. sorry. Exactly. No, no, no. It's a perfect example of exactly what I'm talking about. Because it's not always something as simple as like, okay, I need to take off like the points for neatness or color. It's not always that simple, because we can clearly look at that and be like, yes, okay, I understand that that's not an academic skill and really shouldn't be on my rubric anymore. If it's still there, and you're struggling with this, like, ask yourself, why are you including it? And is it okay with you? If a student is able to show you mastery of a skill, but they don't do it the way you want them to, that's the other piece of it. We have to be willing to give up this like adherence to compliance all the time. This idea that they have to do it the way I want them to. They have to put color on it. They have to make it pretty. Like, yeah, I want you to do that because I like it when things look colorful and pretty. But you can show me that you understand this skill, this the plot, the theme, whatever it might be. 
without doing that. If you if that's not a thing that you want to do, but you can show me you mastered the academic skill, great. But Dave, what I love about what you're talking about is this idea that we're now convoluting the skill that we were supposed to be assessing. Are you assessing his ability to speak in front of a crowd and make eye contact and speak with good volume and give a speech that includes all the information necessary? Or are you assessing his ability to comprehend a book? Because those are two separate things and you have to be clear. So when you're looking at your own assessment, those of you that did go grab it, make sure that it's clear what you are assessing, what skills you are looking for in a particular project. And here's where I'm going to get like really, really on my, like, on my soapbox. If there are ways for students to show those skills and have choice in how they do it, let them. If you have a kid who can get up in front of the room and deliver a five minute kick butt speech to show you that they comprehended their novel and that's what they want to do, let them. But if you have another kid who's over here and is incredibly artistic, doesn't really want to get up in front of the class, but can demonstrate that they understand plot, theme, summary, all of it on a one pager that they've created and illustrated themselves let them because they're still showing you that they've mastered a mastered a particular skill they're doing it in a way that works for them and i guarantee they'll show you more because you're giving them the freedom to show you in a way that works for them in a way that they feel comfortable with one of the things that we learn about intrinsic motivation for learning is that students are more likely to be motivated to learn. They will be more motivated to learn and will be more successful if they feel that they are competent at a given thing. When you allow them to choose how they show their learning, they have that sense of competency because they picked it. They have that sense of control of autonomy because they picked it. So they're more likely to be successful and actually show you what they've learned. Mm. I, I feel like I want to go a thousand directions with that. <laughs> and and I, the people responding in the comments right now are loving what you're saying right now. Like, Truth bombs galore. Holly Stewart had me worried, though, because she said, oh, Caitlin said a bad word. And I was like, oh, no, what'd she say? But you said compliant. <laughs> so that was the bad word. But I, my heart started beating a little fast there. Um, I, I want to address a couple of things that you said. And yes. kind of dive into them a little bit deeper. So the first thing I want to address is we are not saying don't teach multiple things. We are saying if you're going to report or assess multiple things, disaggregate it and report multiple things. Don't dump everything into the bucket and then help and try to make the parents and students make sense of all of the things that are in your one quick summation. Disaggregate. Yes data so we can do something with it that's that's rebecca huff just posted the perfect comment for this yes rebecca disaggregate it pull them apart if your goal is to pull up that they can write an introductory paragraph and you are specifically looking for three separate skills report the three separately because you have you might have a student that can write a really awesome thesis statement but they struggle to add context to it and provide a summary to support it but they can write a really strong thesis statement. So you should be reporting those separately, just like Dave said, disaggregate it always. Yes, because that goes to, I mean, we'll, we're gonna cover this in a couple of weeks, but grades are not just about labeling what was. Every single grade assessment assignment should help paint the way to what's to come. It is feedback, it's communication, saying here's where you are in this moment of time so that we can get you to a different place the next moment in time. So it's important for the teacher, the student, everybody to know where that student was in that moment of time so you can all celebrate and monitor and help push forward progress. So that that's super important. I'm glad we were able to break that down. But I want to ask a, a very real question to you right now. And if, you, if you're not prepared for this because I'm putting you on the spot, that's okay. You can pass the baton. It's all good. Ready? So you said, yeah. make sure on your assessment that you are asking about a specific skill or a standard. So here's the question, and it's, it might not be a question people are even ready to go there yet, but I'm going there. How many times does a kid have to be able to get it right for you to know that they've got it right? Okay, this is a phenomenal question. And I will tell you, like, I don't have the right answer to this because I feel like it, it's different. I don't, it's, it's very subjective because there are certain skills, like when I'm teaching sixth grade and I have a kid that comes in and they've done summaries every single year since third grade. 
I'm basically assessing to ensure that they've retained that knowledge and they can still do it with a more complex text. I don't need them to do that like a hundred times for me all year long. Am I going to bring that skill back several times throughout the year? Absolutely I am. But am I going to assess it every single time? Probably not. Because if they're if they can show me they've got it that first few times, that first time even, we've done this before, we've got this. But when it's a newer skill, when it's something that they don't have a lot of experience with, writing thesis statements is a great example. Um, if it's a brand new skill like that, we need to continually do that. Writing one thesis statement successfully doesn't tell me that you can do that on your own. I need to see that you can do that on your own several times and even in several genres of writing to really see that you've got that. So I would say, Dave, it's very subjective and it kind of depends on the background knowledge, on the previous experiences, on whatever it might be that you're assessing and how many different applications it might have. So that's kind of where I'm at. Oh, it's, it's a good answer. <laughs> it is a good answer. It's a very real answer. And now I'll add, again, I'll add a couple layers onto this. Ultimately, your goal, your long-term goal is that you're not doing this stuff in isolation in your room and you're not on teacher island. The goal is that when you start doing something like this, other people jump on board as well. And if you get yourself to the place where students are truly mastering the content and they're mastering the standards, as a seventh grade teacher, you can have confidence that what the sixth grade teacher is reporting as mastery, the students still have. Otherwise, they probably didn't master it, right? So the idea of teaching the mastery is that students have actually mastered something so you can build upon it. So you don't have to go back necessarily and reassess a standard from earlier on year after year after year. That That's one piece of this. My answer to the question, and you said that you don't really, I, I have an answer to this question and I'll tell you exactly what my answer came from. My answer is three. Why three? <laughs> why three, you ask? Because it's more than one. That's why. Because then I, love this. I say three, and then I love when people then have to start arguing why four is better or two is better. I honestly, I don't care. I don't care as long as it's more than one. And then teachers, you can have that debate amongst yourselves. How many times should a kid have to show you they know it? And I, again, I say three. Three <laughs> is a manageable number, and it's bigger than one. And then here's, here's some strategies that I, I tell teachers that they can implement to look for mastery three times. So let's use a math example again. I tell teachers... If you are giving a math assessment or math homework, how many questions does a kid have to get right to show you they know something? And I'm going to, I hate percentages. I hate points. I hate all of those things for lots of reasons because they show frequency of BS and we're not talking about frequency of BS. If you tell <laughs> kids in a math for math homework or a math assignment in class, get three questions right in a row and you're done. You're done. That means you can get questions one, two, and three right and you're done. You might not get three questions in a row right until questions 18, 19, and 20. But when you do, you're good. You've proven it to me. Three in a row. Because three in a row is consistent and recent. And that matters to me. Consistency and recency. Not just three times sporadic. Consistency and recency. So let me give you another anecdote, a real example. This is going to be a scary one for you, Caitlin. Super scary. Okay, let, cool. Let's imagine I'm your principal. Oh, God. Oh God. I quit. Right. <laughs> right. And... And I'm an ew, over David. I'm, ew, David. No, <laughs> let's celebrate this one. Um, so I'm I'm your principal, and I come in and I observe you twelve times this school year, because I'm a principal. Why? I better be in your classroom at least once a month to know what's going on. So I'm in your classroom twelve times this year, right? That's a reasonable expectation. It really is. But let's put that to the side. So I'm in your classroom twelve times. The first, and let's say that you are graded on, on every observation, like a four-point rubric of effectiveness. The first nine times I come into your classroom, you're a three out of a four. You're effective. You're doing a good job. The last three times I come into your room, you are four out of four, highly effective. Because all year long, I've been giving you lots of feedback and coaching, and you're finally demonstrating it. Now you're doing something with it. The last three times, you are killing it. At the end of the year, you are getting a highly effective rating from me because it's consistent and recent. Similar math. Let's say I come into your room 12 times this year. In September, one time you are highly effective. I don't see anything highly effective again until January. One time I see something highly effective. Again, it's hit or miss, lots of threes again. Come back in April, one time it's highly effective. Same math. Three out of 12, there's highly effective. This time though, you're getting an effective. You're getting a three out of a four from me, not a four out of four, because it's not consistent and it's not recent. I want to see consistency and recency. 
I was that teacher that played the game in school. I knew when my scheduled observations were. I taught in the day of file cabinets. I would go pull out my special red folder and I nailed it on evaluation day, on observation day. I nailed it. I was prepared. I taught the same lesson every year, no matter when my observation was, <laughs> September or April, it didn't matter. It was the same lesson. I could tell you what it was to this day. And I got great observation and evaluation scores because I demonstrated mastery one day. But there were a lot of other days I didn't have it. And I probably deserved to get some feedback on those days to help me grow. But I didn't get it. So I tell people consistency and recency matters. Three, if teachers want to argue, no, it should only be two. Cool. Argue about it. I don't care. <laughs> But it needs to be consistent and recent. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's it's such a good point because we think about this and and the reason that I cannot stand the traditional percentages and things like that is because it's it's taking an average of all of these scores over time. And I have such an issue with that because it's not recent, because it may not be showing a consistent behavior. If we are sitting down and we're just taking a straight average of all these different scores over time, but a student has since the very beginning shown growth and they are now consistently and most recently able to show you, I have got this. Those first few times they tried something should not be held against them. That first few times they took that risk and tried that learning out should not detract from the fact that now they consistently get it. Well, it, it, even, even beyond that, if we do that, it goes against everything we talked about last week. Last week, we said grades are not about compliance. It, they should not be used as a carrot or a stick. They, are, they should be an accurate representation, a snapshot in time to demonstrate what a student has, has shown mastery of or progress of on an external tool measuring their internal knowledge. And if it's a snapshot in time, it needs to represent that snapshot in time. As a parent, if my kid, and this is a whole question for uh, probably another session down the road, this is one of the reasons that we have so much frustration when people start talking about retakes and redos and what happens when every single student wants to turn in all their work at the end of a 10-week period. Well, why do we say that they have to, we have to have this arbitrary 10-week period that we give one grade to? That's the issue. It's not the issue about retakes and redos. It's that our grades don't re represent a snapshot in time, the most recent and consistent evidence. We try to lump everything together and have people chasing points so they can get brownie <laughs> points and bumper stickers and a spot on stage. We distort the process. Yes. And I feel like, too, it's important to note that this isn't just in K-12 education that this happens. <laughs> in university settings, you see this a lot where grades are convoluted with other things that aren't necessarily a snapshot of what that student knows or can do in a content area academically. It's not giving you that external representation of internal knowledge. I really like that, by the way. So I'm going to be <laughs> remembering that. Um, but it's not doing that. Like when you're incorporating things like 10% of your grade is for attendance, 10% of your grade is for participation. Like, are those academic skills? Or are those behaviors? What are we assessing here? Because we need to make sure that we take that step back and really ask ourselves, what are we trying to do with the grade? What are we trying to measure? What are we trying to show in this assessment, in this grade for this class? Is it academic skills? Is it a snapshot of that knowledge in this per in, at this particular time? Or are we, again, trying to show how well our students complied with what we wanted them to do? Boom. But boom. So it, those of you that have your assessments in front of you right now, again, use, use that assessment like mirror, mirror on the wall. Look at it and say, mirror, mirror, or assessment, assessment in my hand. <laughs> what do I know about my kids from this? When you look at that, can you tell what specific skills your students are showing progress or mastery towards or evidence of learning? And or what compliant behaviors am I really documenting here? And it, the first question is, do you know? If you look at it and say, I honestly don't know. Well, then awesome. I want you to acknowledge that and recognize that because that's an amazing opportunity to say, and now what? If you're looking at it again, you're saying, well, there's a whole lot of stuff convoluted in here. Okay. That doesn't mean that that's necessarily a bad assessment, but is there a way for you to disaggregate it so that parents, teachers, students, everybody knows what each question is really assessing, what you're analyzing? Because truly each question is an assessment in and of itself. It, assessment's not the whole paper, not the whole desk. Every single question is an assessment. So do you know 
what you're really looking for? That's a huge question starter. So I'm glad you put that on the table, Caitlin. Yeah, it's it's important. And it's one of those things that if you start asking yourself that question on the assessment you have right now, but you start doing that on all the assessments that you have, that's huge. If you start really critically looking through, okay, in this assessment, is it clear to me and therefore my students what I am looking for here? Am I able to disaggregate those skills? Am I able to eliminate some things that I was looking for that aren't really academic in nature, or aren't what I'm assessing in this particular and this particular assignment? But they're just something else that I threw on here, like speaking, like listening, like whatever it might be. Take those off. Find mm -hmm. another place to assess those skills. It will make your grade so much clearer. Even if you're like me, working within a system right now where you have to give points percentages, you can clarify those. You can make it better. Yeah. And better is good. For sure. For sure. And I, I want to wrap up today with talking about that. Those people that live within those systems and some real tactical things that they can do. At first, Justin Belt saying, hey, Dave. Hey, Miss G. So, hey, Justin. <laughs> Glad you're here. Lot, lots of amazing friends are chiming in with comments. But I, I'm seeing a couple of people saying, I wish I could do that. But I live in a system that doesn't allow that. I've got percentages. I've got points. I'm just going to give people one little nugget. And Caitlin, I know you live this system every single day. So maybe you can give people something too. <laughs> so mine is, I'm going to give you something. It's very simple. And at first, you're going to say, I, that's not a, a huge help. But I promise you, if you try it, it will be a huge help. So let's say you live in that system where you have points percentages. Let's say you live in that system where you have mandates of how many times you have to update your grade book. Let's say you live in a system where you have to give quizzes or tests every single Friday. Let's say that you live in a system where they say every quiz or test has to be a 10 question quiz. I mean, you are in a box, okay? 10 questions every Friday, points and percentages. Here's a quick little trick for you. This Friday, try this. Take your 10 question quiz and I want you to break it into three sections. Why three? Because I like three. Ray pointed out, it's my favorite number. <laughs> Three sections. <laughs> Section one, I want you to focus on whatever standard or skill you focused on this week. So it's based off of the present and give six questions based off of this week. And again, you're just looking for three in a row. So six questions. So you're giving kids multiple opportunities to get three questions in a row right. So six questions based off the standard for this week. The next two questions, I want them to be based off of a standard that you taught prior to, maybe a month ago, two months ago. And then your last two questions, Focus on what you're anticipating to teach next week. So you've got three sections on your test demonstrating present, past, and future. You're using this to document evidence of what they know now, what they still know, and what they know in the future. Using this to plan for the future, to continue to document evidence of what, what you need to remediate and support, and what they know now. Living in that box, but taking a step in the right direction. So your turn, Caitlin. I love that. That's perfect. So if you are like me and you're teaching in this points and percentages world right now, and it's it's so difficult for you to find ways to make this work, I feel you. Again, I also teach in the humanities. So I live in the rubrics. I live with rubrics. That's what we do. You do not have to make a rubric for every single type of assessment that you do. You have to ask yourself, what are those power standards, those core standards, those essential standards that you need your students to learn? and you write your rubrics for those standards. That's it. Determine the levels of proficiency you want to use. I'm happy to chat with you about this one-on-one, -on -one, literally anytime. I love talking about this stuff. You determine your levels of proficiency like you would on any rubric, or you can use single point rubrics because those are awesome too, but create a rubric for each of the standards that you will assess. Determine how many, how many points you'll assign for each of those levels of proficiency. And there you go. You're working mm. within the points and percentages system, just like I am, but you're able to do it in a way that is still aligned with standards, aligned with measuring academic proficiency and academic skill. And you're able to disaggregate those different pieces that you're looking to disaggregate. Now, I am seeing like so much over here about the five paragraph essay and like folks you're <laughs> trying to like give me a heart attack right now um to bring up the five paragraph essay i might have and seen like, your opinion about this recently yes yeah. <laughs> and i feel like i'm just not gonna get into it because i'll keep talking for like 15 more minutes um we don't 
need to teach five paragraph essays all the time. It's ridiculous and a waste of everything because it's how many times, ask yourself about the favorite, the best thing you've ever read in your entire life. Think to yourself, what is the best piece of writing that you have ever read ever? I can guarantee it wasn't a five paragraph essay. You want to talk about powerful writing, changing the world through writing. You want to talk about communicating a message. It's not going to be done through a five paragraph essay. Everybody should go buy the book, Why They Can't Write. Read that because you will love it. And it will change your whole life if you teach writing or anything like that. Please buy that book, Why They Can't Write. Do it. <laughs> and on that note, Caitlin, yes, <laughs> you just you threw it out there at the end. That's amazing. That was the that was the ninth inning walk off grand slam home run to win the game. So well played, well played, Caitlin. I, I just want to give people a preview of what's still to come because I feel like we left people today with some some tactical things that they can walk away with, some things that they can really wrestle with. I also want to put this out here that. This is, this is kind of like the Sir Mix-a-Lot thing. You and I, we, we like it when people say the big butts. Like, I can't do this. I would do this, but we, we love that because you can do this. You will do this. You should do this. Don't let those big butts get in the way. You can keep, continue to do this. There are ways to keep working around it, to work through it, to take that next step and to lead other people along. So next week, the conversation. Whew, jumping through zeros and deadlines. I love it. Love it. So we're going to talk zero deadlines, all of that stuff, the arbitrary things that we um, argue about that we probably don't need to argue about and the stuff that actually makes sense. And we'll bring that into the conversation. Like that will be week three. Week four, that conversation about formative and summative. And I love how we even title it formative versus summative. <laughs> Not and, but versus, which I love. <laughs> and then we'll have our fifth week coming up in May where it's it's going to be a lot of Q&A and just trying to help people with where they are. So continue to capture your questions, continue to reach out to us, let us know how we can help support you on this journey as you go, as you have questions, as you start the conversation with those you work with. Caitlin, any final words from you? Nope. Love you all, Dave. It's always an honor to be on screen with you poking the bear and having those fun conversations. You're awesome. Just happy You're awesome. To be here. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have an amazing week. We will see you soon. Again, let us know how we can help you. Go out there and just tomorrow, take one step, one step, and make yourself a little bit better. We'll see you soon.